You ever done anything or something that you uh, really uh, regretted? <laughs> anybody, anybody been there? Yeah. Um, like one of those things, not like, man, <laughs> but like something you, you, you like kind of kicked yourself for a while afterwards. Like you, you go back in your mind and you relive it and you're like, oh, what was I thinking? Well, I had, I had something like that happen. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, uh, a retreat, a family retreat, and it was awesome. I'm not, I don't regret that I went. That was awesome. If you, if you get a chance, you should, you should check it out. Um, but one of the things they do there is they play this, this game of dodgeball <laughs> on Saturday night. Something you, you need to know about me. Maybe you don't know looking at me, but I love dodgeball. <laughs> From the time I was a little boy, apparently till the time I'm 37, um, uh, I have loved dodgeball. And uh, there is a switch in me that flips uh, when, when balls start flying and uh, testosterone starts to, to pump. And, and um, all I can say is I walked away from that. We played from 10 to, I think, 11.30, and I walked out of there that night, and I was like, what just happened? <laughs> and I, I was walking back, and I, I reflected on it, and I was like, you know what? I, I was telling the elders this week, I'm not very proud of the way I played the game of dodgeball that night. Actually, I played pretty well. Like, if you, if you, just, if you just took it from a, from a strictly performance standpoint, I, I played pretty well. But, like, like this, this part of me that I don't really like, this, like, ultra-competitive, like, I need to win, like, at all costs kind of thing, like, not consi- I, I didn't, like, take at any little kids. I wasn't, like, yelling, I don't think. I don't think I was yelling or I, I, I didn't punch anybody. Like, there wasn't anything like that. But I look back on it and it's like, you know what? You know what came out of me? It was all focused on me. It's like, I want to win. I want to get Danny Klaus out no matter what I need to do. <laughs> Is he here right now? Second service. Yeah, maybe. But I walked, I walked away that night, and, I, and I've just been, like, I, I've, been, I've been ruminating on that, because I, I have this, I just like, man, I wish, <laughs> and the worst part is I'm a pastor, and I'm new, and, and like, people were watching this. I was, like, flying across the, the place, and I was, I was just, I was just, I was super intense guy, and that's not who I want to be. But it's interesting, like, I look at back at that, and you, we laugh at that, it's like, it's funny, right? Um... But in my, in my heart, I believe, I believe that was wrong of me. I'm not, I'm not uh, casting stones at anybody else. Like, I don't know what else was going on in other people's hearts. Just for me, like, I, I think that was, that was a sinful way for me to act. And guess what? I got up the next morning, and I, I went to breakfast, and I didn't want to look people in the eye. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I, I was like, uh, maybe I can, like, get breakfast late. I didn't really want to look people in the eye, but that's, that's what sin does. Sin cre- like, like we live in a culture in the world where we don't, we don't talk about sin. We don't, we don't really like, like, as a culture, we don't really believe that sin is real. You know, that we have phrases like, hey, you just be you. And, and they would say to me, well, Seth, you were just being you. You were just, you know, like uh, doing whatever you wanted to do in your heart, and that's Okay. But we all know, like we've all experienced, like when, when, when somebody sins or when we sin, there, there can be real harm created for somebody else's life. Thankfully, I didn't just like peg a five-year-old with a ball like, and, and like give someone a concussion, right, like, like, or, or anything like that. But, but sometimes there can be real harm created because of the sinful, selfish stuff in us. Not only that, but there can, be, there, there can be like real harm created. There can be like perceived harm created. Like, like I walked into breakfast that next morning and I was like, I felt ashamed. I felt a little twinge of guilt back in the back of my mind. Like, man, what was I doing? Now, like I like sat across from people and I was like, I wonder what they're thinking about me. I wonder if they're going to want to get rid of me as their pastor after that business. If so, you can have a meeting later. But, um, 
But it, it creates, it, it's a real thing, and it creates real harm, and it, it really changes relationships. And you know, the worst thing uh, for me as, as I was thinking about it was, like, that's, that's not who I want to be. And that's not how I want people to, per, like, when they, when they look at me, like, I, I don't want people to, like, think of Jesus in that way. I don't want there to be this dichotomy between, like, what, what I, I, I know there always is, but I don't really want there to be this huge dichotomy between what I say and how I act. And for people to be able to look at that and say, look, at, he's, just, he's just another hypocrite. And for them to be able to, like, like detract from the name of Christ because of the way that I live. See, sin can create real harm. It can damage relationships. It can damage the name of Christ. And this morning, we are going to continue on. We're, we're just starting the series in 1 John. And it's interesting to know where John goes. Because last week, last week he introdu- I introduced the book, and, and in the first four verses, he gives this kind of beautiful vision of like, hey, hey, we really touched Jesus. We, we experienced him in a real way and everything that he had to offer. And guess what? It changed our life. And, and what we want to do is we want to offer that to others. We want you to enter into that same kind of joyful fellowship that we have. And it's very interesting to me, he could have gone a lot of different directions, but the first thing he does after that introduction is he takes on the issue of sin. And I think he's making a statement, as he puts it in order, about like, like what, what is it that damages fellowship with God? It's sin. What is it that interferes with fellowship with other people? It's it's. Our selfish, sinful natures. And so if, if we are going to have what he is, is inviting us into, we need a solution for our sin problem. We need a way to deal with it. And so that's what he's going to offer us this morning. So if you have your Bibles and you turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to chapter 2, verse 2 is our text for the morning. And it'll be on the screen but you could say like this, how do, how do we have, like in a world full of sin, in a world full of imperfect people, in a church, you guys are great, but, but I don't think anybody here is perfect, in, in a church full of imperfect people, how do we have true fellowship? Because we are going to rub each other wrong, we're going to get over competitive in a dodgeball game, we are going to say and do and act in ways that, that are, are not edifying, not loving. And yet God, he, John, and, and through John, God is calling us to this fellowship of the church. So what do we do with that? Uh, so if you have, you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, it'll be on the screen. I'd also like to say, if you don't have a Bible, there are pew Bibles in, in the pew in front of you. On page 1021 in your pew Bible, it is, is the text, and we would just, I'd invite you to take it with you. If you're new here, you don't have a Bible, man, would you take that with you and read it this week? If you're dealing with some kind of guilt, you have some kind of sin issue going on, like, like I, don't, I don't know of any book that helps me like, deal with that, think about it, rightly understand it, as well as this one. So I just invite you to take it and read it this week. So here's, here's the text. It says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, this is is the real part. This is the family part. This is the part everybody knows. Like, if we say, yeah, you know, if we say we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. 
my little children. And, and remember, this book is written to a church, and it has lots of and lots of family metaphors in it. That's why we have this cutout of the family up here. That's what we have, but we have a family cutout back there, and you'll see that, like, migrate around the church. But he uses all these family metaphors as he's talking to these people, because the church is to be family. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So this morning, we're going to look, we're gonna look at uh, just a few points. We're going to look at this problem, this problem that sin brings in our lives and in our world. We're going to look at what John says about it. We're going to, we're going to look at it, you know, just through the, the lens of experience. And we're going to, we're going to talk about what is, what is the solution? What is he offering us here? Because like, it's one thing to identify a problem. It's something else to actually deal with and help with that issue and that problem. And then thirdly, like, where, where, do, where does that lead us? Where does that lead us? So here's the problem, and, and this is a... <laughs> As Christians, we would agree with this statement. Sin messes up everything. Sin messes up everything. It messes up everything. As I, as I said earlier, it messes up our relationship with God. We're going to look at that a little bit. It messes up our fellowship with other people because we injure other people, we rub people wrong. It drives us to, to do things and it creates wedges between us creates little questions like I had in the back of my mind, like, what, what do they think about me? It messes up everything. It's the actual issue, the actual problem in our world. It's not lack of education. It's not lack of resources, ultimately. It's the central issue of sin. Sin messes up everything. It messes up everything. And it messes up our relationship with God. And so that's where John starts. He says, in verse 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him, from Jesus, and proclaimed to you. And then he says this, That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now this is an interesting thing for John to say, because if you search the Gospels, nowhere in the Gospels are you going to find Jesus saying the words, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It doesn't, it's not in there. So John, John is saying, like, this is the message we heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But then there's a question. So Jesus, we never actually hear Jesus saying this in the gospel. So what's up with this, John? So we, one of two things has to be true. Either this is something that Jesus did say that John had heard him say that didn't make it into one of the gospel narratives. Or, what I think is a little bit more likely, John is taking, like, the whole of what Jesus taught and kind of synthesizing it and, and putting it in, into a one-sentence like statement that he's going to use to, to build the rest of the book. We don't know which one is, which one is actually true because we don't have a video recording of Jesus' whole life. We don't, know, we don't know exactly what he said. He may have said this very statement. We just don't have it recorded in the Gospels. But this is the first thing. He, John says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he's going to tie this into the issue of sin a, a little bit later, but we've got to understand the metaphor of light, the metaphor of light in the Bible. Jesus uses it. He says in John 8, 12, this is as close to this, this statement as he gets. He says, I am the light of the world. And then he goes on, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus picks up on this metaphor of light and darkness. But this metaphor of light and darkness has at least two, two things connected to it. Psalm 119, 105. This is the first one. It has this idea of, of being true. And I think this is what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 119, 105. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It illuminates the correct way for me to live. It shines, it shines a light on what is actually true, what is real, and what is reality so that I know which way to go, so that I know what decisions to make, so that I know how I, should, uh, how I ought to act, so that I know how I ought to think, 
This is what he's saying about God's word. And God's word in the, the Jewish mind was truth. Was truth. And so there's this element of light. When you, when you see it in the Bible, it is, it is the truth. That's one side of it. But there's another side as well that's important to understand. And in Isaiah, Isaiah is talking to this, this broken, like corrupt society. He's calling them to repent, calling them back to God. And, and he says this in, in chapter 5. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So here Isaiah is introducing another side of this light and darkness metaphor. And it is, it is the idea of like righteousness, of goodness, of morality, of an ethical way of living. So there's two, two things in play when John is saying God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He's saying at least two things. He's saying number one, God is truth. And make no mistake, like, like in our culture, we believe each one of us, we have our own truth, and there's no big T truth that, that corresponds to reality. John, John is not saying that. He, he's saying God is truth with a capital T. And everything he says corresponds to reality because actually everything he says conforms reality to, to his reality. When he speaks, reality becomes. That's the, the God that we see in the Bible. So there's the truth side, there's the reality side. There's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the, the terms of, there's the um, out in the open side of light. But then there's also, there's the, there's the good, there's the righteous side of light. And John is saying here in 1 John 1, 5, he said, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. In other words, God, God is truth. God is completely out in the, the he's, he's unhidden. And he's righteous. And so he goes on in, in our, our text. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, with this God who is light, we say, want to say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if, if the light is, is truth, is reality, is what is really going on, and it is goodness and righteousness, then it would seem right to think that the opposite of those things would be the darkness. Darkness is living unrighteously. And I would say walking, walking not in the truth or, not, or in hiddenness. That, that, is, that is walking in darkness. He says, if we walk in darkness, we are not in fellowship with him. And notice, notice there's, there's two things there. And I, I would call these two necessary conditions. If you're going to walk in darkness, these, both of these things need to be true for you. Number one, you need to walk in hiddenness in your life. You need to just keep it covered up, keep it secret, like never, never, as we're going to come to in a second, never, never admit when, when you do something wrong, never confess, like, like keep, just, just, you know, which is a natural tendency that we have. Honestly, I told the elders on Tuesday, I said, I don't want to get up and tell them about the dodgeball game. Why? Because, like, it shows I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a broken dude. And that's hard. Well, what we want to do is we want to put on this mask and this face that like, hey, I've got it. Everything's under control. I'm, I'm doing just fine. And that's one side of walking in darkness. The other side is walking in, in unrighteousness and sin, which he's going to get to in a minute. That's walking in darkness. And what's the problem with that? The problem in verse 7, uh, it says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship 
with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is, this is the, the good side. So I rewrote the verse, okay? I don't, I'm not suggesting we rewrite the Bible, but I want, I want you to see the logical uh, flip side of this. It says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If you change it, and it says, if we walk in the darkness, here's what it would say, we do not have fellowship with one another. This is, this is the dichotomy that John is introducing. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God and with one another. If we walk in the darkness, we don't have fellowship with God or one another. As I said, it actually messes up our relationships. Walking in the darkness creates harm. Our sin creates harm in other people's lives, in our lives, in our relationship with God. And then when we walk around, we say, well, it wasn't a big deal. This is what we do. We excuse ourselves, well, it was just, you know, it's just a dodgeball game. Nobody got hurt. There were other people who were doing the same thing. That creates, that creates harm as well. And we're just covering up who we really are. And so we don't have fellowship with one another. And this is, this is what he, he's, he's um, getting at. So what, what are the sins? That, that mess up our lives. We could, I could list like a big name of, uh, uh, the, you could put the big ones up here. Like there's like the addictions, like violence, stealing. You could go through the Ten Commandments. Most of those we have laws against and they will wind, wind you in jail if you do most of those. And those are, those are not good. Those, those are very harmful and destructive, and those need to be brought out into the light. For most of us, though, like we, we are well-socialized like people who've been going to church for a long time, and so we're like, okay, I, I know I, I can't do those things at the very least, because if I do those things, I will go to jail, and I don't want to go to jail. Ergo, I'm not going to do those things, right? But there's, there's, like, there's a smaller list, and this is the list that I want to highlight for my, myself. Like, like what, what would you call, well, I wrote it down here. Overactive, selfish competitiveness, like I was displaying. Yeah, I'd say that's sinful. And whether or not it created like a huge amount of harm for, for people around me, man, it did, it did create harm in my perception of what a relationship's going to be like. Created a sense of shame for me. That's one, what, what about, here's one. I know I'm, I'm probably the only one who wrestles with this one. What about, like, anger? Like, just kind of, like, nurturing, like, ill intent and in thoughts about somebody in your heart because maybe they hurt you or they did something against you or, 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 or whatever it is, just, just some kind of anger. Yeah, that's in there. Oftentimes, I think, I think in, in, you know, we're Minnesota nice. Well, you guys are. I'm still from Iowa. But uh, you're, you're nicer? Yeah. Oh, you're nice? Yeah, you guys are from Iowa. So, yeah, yeah, you get it. All right. Thanks, Landon. <laughs> Not that Iowans aren't nice. Just there's a phrase called Minnesota nice. Actually, there's a phrase called Iowa nice. So, um, but you know, you know what we do with anger? Often it just turns into kind of a uh, like under under the radar resentment, and kind of a heart that's just just kind of nasty and 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 resents another person. We don't we don't often give full vent to our anger, but we'll let it out in in like sneaky kind of little ways. And I'm not, I'm just talking about me, guys. Anxiety. Here's one that creates harm. And it keeps us, keeps us from, from walking in the fellowship that God has for us with him and with others. When we're constantly living in fear and worry. You, I, could go, I could go on and on down the list about things that I wrestle with and that you probably wrestle with and are common. And John's message to us, I think, is that, that those things... They're not okay. 
they actually create harm. They actually have ramifications in our life, and they need to be dealt with. Because sin messes up everything. But thankfully, John doesn't start there. Here's a, here, or stop there. Here's, here's the solution. He, gives, he offers us a solution. He, he offers us, hey, walking in the light. And I even rhymed it for you. Walking in the light makes it right. Walking in the light makes it right. Like, like if we walk in the light, this is what he's saying. If you walk in the light, this will, this will deal with sin. It will deal with, it, it, won't, it won't make it all, all right. Like, like sin does create real harm. But walking in the light is the thing that we can do to deal with the sin in our hearts and our lives. Walking in the light. Because the, the reality is, he, he lets us in on this in verse t- 8 and 10. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And in verse 10, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. That means each and every one of us, if we're in here, like you're breathing, we have sin in our hearts, whatever it looks like. But the good news is this. He goes on in verse, verse 1. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Why? Because sin is a real thing. It creates real consequences. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And this is the good news. This is the reason we, we were singing earlier. Because on my own, I'm, I am in big trouble because of what is going on in my heart. And which sometimes comes out in my actions. Which probably almost 100% of the time would come out in any game of dodgeball I ever played. I better just stay away from that. And here, here's, here's the thing on this. Uh, going back to the dodgeball thing. Like, you, 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 know, you know what made me feel the worst? Was there was somebody playing that game. And this person, I'm not going to identify them. But this person was playing it the way that I wanted to play. See, we could, we could throw the ball. When someone would get out, we could throw it to our teammates on the other side. And if you caught it, you could get back in the game. And guess what? I would get out, and I would go back there, and I'd call for the ball. They'd throw me the ball, and I'd go right back in the game because I wanted to win. Can't let Danny Klaus win. That's right. We've got to beat him. Or whatever. But there was, there was someone playing this game. And this person... This person, we would throw them the ball, and you know what they would do? They would turn around and they would hand this ball to a little kid. And then that little kid would get to go in the game. And I watched that, and I was like, Seth, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Like, here you are, like, playing like this is, like, you're 17, and you really have something to prove, and, and like, you're playing totally focused on yourself. And here's this person, and they are what I would call a righteous dodgeballer. <laughs> right? They were a righteous dodgeballer. I was an unrighteous dodgeballer. Like, this person was a righteous dodgeballer. And I'm sure they're not perfect. But that's just a little picture. Like that's a, that's a, that's how G, I believe that's how Jesus would play dodgeball. If he was out there, it wouldn't look a lot like what I was doing. It would look a lot more like this person. They were a righteous dodgeballer. And this is this is this is the the beautiful thing because on our own, on my own, I can't deal. If if uh, if walking in the darkness is walking not in truth in walking in unrighteousness. I can't do anything about the unrighteousness part. Like, I can't, I can't really address that because I can't go in the past. I can't change my behavior. I can't do anything in the past. What John is saying, though, in this verse is if we do sin, there's one, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he goes on in the next verse, and he says he is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, this is, this is the good news of the gospel. Like, yeah, I'm, I am a mess up. 
in so many ways. But there is this guy, and he was totally righteous. He was a righteous dodgeballer. He was a righteous everything. In my life compared to his life, it's, it's, it's not, no comparison. But he sacrificed himself on the cross so that my sin could be dealt with. And then... I want to come to the verse. This, this is how we deal with it. Like it's, it's understanding that, it's recognizing that, it's rejoicing in that fact, and then it's coming to this and saying, God, you know what? We just confess our sins. This is, it's, it's so easy. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, guess what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how we deal with sin. We, we say to God, God, yeah, I totally blew it in that game. God, I totally blew it at work. Father, I totally blew it in that conversation. I'm so sorry. Would you change me? Would you help me turn from that? Would you, would you make me new? And it says, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But then, that, that's, that's restoring our fellowship with God. Then we can walk, walk in light of God. We can look at God and we can think, God, God, on the basis of Christ, he's not angry at me. He's not out to get me. Because of Jesus, like, like I am free of that. And I don't have to walk in that guilt before him. But then, but then this, is, this is amazing because in verse 7 he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we understand that Jesus takes care of our righteousness and we, we confess our sins. I think this is what he's saying. We confess our sins. We bring them out into the light. We call them what they actually are. He says, we have fellowship with one another. With one another. So I was looking forward to preaching this sermon. Because this is my confession to you. About what was going on in my heart that night. And the, the, little, the little secret about confession is, is like it, it, actually, it actually creates fellowship or it can create fellowship. Because I, I'm guessing I'm not the only one who struggles with those overactive or overactive competitive tendencies when they get in a dodgeball game. I'm probably not the only one who wrestles with, with any of the things that I wrestle with. And neither are you. So when we understand that Jesus is righteous and I don't have to be righteous and I don't have to put on this face in front of other people, and when I, when I can say to, to those close to me, I can say, you know what? I struggled with this this week. I've almost never found someone say, well, wow, you struggle with sin. Wow, I, I don't struggle with that. Or they say, you know what? I, I struggle with the same thing. Or I struggle with a similar thing. And there's, there's like a bond of fellowship because we, we have a mutual struggling, but we also have a mutual Savior. So walking in the light, I think, it makes it right. That's what John is saying to us. So what does that mean for us this week? My prayer for myself and for us is that we would walk boldly in the light. Not because we, we like embrace our sin and think, well, this is just me being me but because Jesus paid for our sins. He's a propitiation for our sins. So my righteousness is not based on my performance. My righteousness is based on his perfect righteousness. So I just have a few things, a few like concrete things. I'm, I'm gonna say this. I don't know if you've, you've heard this phrase, but there's a phrase out there that says, it's called preach the gospel to yourself. So for a couple weeks, I've been, I've been like thinking about this dodgeball deal. And you know what, you know what I have to do? Say, okay, I, I have to admit, okay, that, that was probably not good to, to myself. But then I can't, I can't just wallow in that. Like a little bit of healthy guilt is good. But to live my life and to accept that as my identity, that's, that's not Okay. The gospel is, yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner. Guess what? There was a righteous one. 
And my righteousness is not based on myself. My righteousness is based on Him. And because of Him, I, I have righteousness. Like that, that moment of weakness does not define me. What defines me is His righteousness. i got to repeat that over and over and over to myself. That's preaching the gospel to yourself. Uh, another thing we need to do that's it's tied in with that is we've got to confess our sin to God and to others. We've got to say to God, God, I'm not going to excuse it. I'm not going to justify it anymore. It is, it's wrong. It's sin. And, and I'm sorry. And we need some people in our lives that will, that will be close and will keep uh, us safe. They aren't going to go spreading our stuff around. But who we can confess to. Because there's days when, when I need somebody else to tell me the truth. I need somebody else to say to me, Seth, you're forgiven. Seth, Jesus paid for you. Jesus even paid for some dodgeball antics. Some of us, maybe we need to ask, ask for forgiveness. One of the things I've, I've realized just in talking, getting to know all of you, so there's a lot of families in here that have been here a long time. And I'm sure there's people, and you've like, you've like gone like this, or you've rubbed each other wrong, or somebody's, you know, kid said something about your kid, or like, like I mean, like, that's just people being people, right? And in a group, a, a church like this, I'm sure we, we, there's forgiveness that needs to be asked, and needs to be offered, and needs to be received. And there's healing in that. Until it happens, like there can't really be healing and moving forward, but, but man, that, that, that is so necessary for the health of a church, for the glory of God, for the restoration of relationships. Then the last thing, like this, this is a joyful way to live. Like, like for us to be able to admit, like, hey, I'm weak. I mess up. For me to be able to take that mask down, that's a joyful way to live. I don't have to hide. I don't have to think, you know, you know, like make you all think like I've got it all together all the time. I don't. I said, we can just relish walking in the light. We can relish that. Here's, here's, here's the thing. I, uh, the, the first point of the sermon, I said, sin messes up everything. And sin is it's bad, it's evil, it's what took Jesus to the cross. But here's the thing, unconfessed, undealt with sin messes up everything. But confessed, forgiven sin can create fellowship, an even, even greater sense of love for our Savior. It can create fellowship with the rest of the body of Christ as well. So that's my, my prayer for us, is that we would experience that together. So, so um, what we're going to do now in response is, is we, we looked up, Deb, Deb found this. It's a prayer of confession. So we are going to like say this together. It's a corporate prayer of confession. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close us in prayer. And we're going to sing one, one song and go out. So this, this is what it says. I want you to, to read it along with me. It says, we confess, our Father, that we do not live up to the family name. We are more ready to resent than to forgive, more ready to manipulate than to serve, more ready to fear than to love, more ready to keep our distance than to welcome more ready to compete than to help. At the root of this behavior is mistrust. We do not love one another as we should because we do not believe that you love us as you do. Forgive us our cold unbelief and make more vivid to us the meaning and depth of your love at the cross. Show us what it costs you to give up your son that we might become your sons and daughters. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our righteousness. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you that you are our righteousness and we can rejoice in you. Help us to walk in the light.